I've never seen anything like it. The fire equivalent of an ice age. Like peering into Dante's Inferno. And it's only going to accelerate. This is only a beginning. We're surrounded by fire. My dad put his hand on my shoulder and he said, don't leave. Whatever you do, do not let that building burn down. Evacuate. Everything was on fire. The looks on their faces, they were sure they were going to die. Run for your life. I've never seen that look in anybody's face. The world is waking up to the hellish realization that all over this planet, wildfires are burning us alive. Most of the people I know lost everything. And that's why we came to be embedded with firefighters on what turned out to be the deadliest day for fires in California. Yet again, two years in a row, we're caught with our pants down. You're left making decisions you don't want to make. It was difficult, very difficult. <laughs> Private firefighters protect people with money. Bring your own brigade. If we're at war fire, we're going to spend a lot of money, we're going to take a lot of casualties, and we're going to lose. And I still don't think the public understands that. Your outsider perspective on this was the first thing I wanted to ask you about because I have covered I, am, I grew up in California, I've been a journalist in California, and I felt like, oh, fire, I totally know everything that there is to know about this, but this film had so much new, different information in it and such just a critically different perspective. And I say it as a New Yorker, of course you're not, but I love that line when if, whoever it was assumed yeah. that you were a New Yorker. But Wait a minute, are you from New York? I, I actually was born in New York, but I grew up out here. That's, that was the line. Yeah. Wait a minute, are you from New York? I, and I'm just curious what you think you were able to bring to this project by nature of the fact that you are not from this country, you are not from California, you did not grow up with fire in the same way that we here have grown up with fire? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question, except I feel like the film answered that, and I'm like, what do you think that I brought to it? Um, uh, and we should step back, by the way, because we don't have Maeve with us. We have our amazing Maeve, um, the incredible firefighter who you just met. She would have been here tonight with us um, and she sends her regrets, but her um, one of her kids just tested positive for COVID and she didn't want to risk it. Um, uh, so she couldn't be here. So I think she was advertised. And um, now you're stuck with us. Um, I mean, it's hard to say what I brought to it, right? But I always think that, um, mm, I hope it's not the obvious stuff, because I don't think we need to, to, to make a film about the stuff that we know already. That's always true. Um, I just knew with this film that I, it was a film that was perhaps, unlike some of my other, films, it wasn't driven by an idea of what could be a really great finished film. It was more driven by this determination to actually really get to the bottom of what was happening and to really answer this question for myself um, of what was going on with this landscape because I didn't understand it. and the commitment I had was to just um, keep going until I really felt like I had my arms around that. And that's the film. And it's kind of a hairy, um, uh, you know, shaggy dog story in a way, right? It, it, structurally, it, it just kind of, you know, follows what needs to happen, I feel. Um, and it turned out that the truth was all quickly complicated. Um, and I didn't want to shortchange that. I didn't want to make reality simpler than it is. Um, and I felt like I had to honor the answer that I found. Um, and so I don't know if that's my outsider perspective or just my um, uh, awkward integrity, probably. I don't think that's outsiderism. I think that's just yeah, um, 
a kind of refusal to simplify when the commitment was to the truth of the situation. The truth of the situation was the complexity that I found in the story, that it wasn't just climate change, it wasn't just one thing. And when you pulled on that thread, um, really what you discovered was a whole lot about how we're living in the world today. And um, that told me everything about how we're living in the world today and it wasn't just about fire. But I'm a bit jet lagged, so we should ask more sp specific questions because otherwise I'll just ramble very, very vaguely. Well, I will say that what I thought, because you asked, you know, what did we think of your outsider perspective? And I think what this film, what was so revelatory to me was what, and especially I have to say with the timing of it coming out in the midst of a pandemic, is how deeply American we can be and how sometimes that explains a lot, you know, and sometimes defies certain logic. And, and I'm curious as you watch this story unfold and you started peeling away the layers of it all. And for example, that, that city council meeting where they say, nope, five feet defensible space, nope, not going to do it. What it, what it was like for you as a filmmaker to get to that level of understanding what a uniquely American perspective led us to the place that we're in now? Well, I will say that I've never been in any of my films. I've never narrated any of my films. and I've certainly never um, put a shot of myself. And of course, I wasn't intending to use that shot of myself. Um, it just so happened the camera was pointing that way at one point, and that was the only few frames we had of me. But I felt like that was the best way of um, telling the story of that moment was to include my face in that moment because it was such a heavy moment for me. Um, I think a lot about the tension between individualism and what you might call socialism depending on where you <laughs> where you feel uh, your political allegiances lie but um, no but you know that that tension between um, the individual and the community you know I think my first film was about Amish people trying to decide whether to be Amish, which is kind of the ultimate non-individualistic um, community in the US, um, or American, which is kind of the ultimate individual, you know, um, uh, path in this world right now. Um, and um, several of my films have been about that. I did a film, um, my second film, Blind Sight, was about um, blind people climbing Mount Everest, but what it was really about um, was about a team of um, you know, German educators, American mountaineers, and Tibetan students all going up Everest together and having a kind of giant moment of culture clash culminating in a really fantastic argument at 23,000 feet um, about how we relate to mountains and whether to climb up them or not, and whether one person should stand on top or whether you know, you should build a school instead or something. So it was very much about that culture clash. And I, th I think as a European who's moved to the US um, and left my own kind of family and culture behind, I think, that, I think, I think about this a lot, about the genetics of what it takes to leave. Um, and I felt like, you know, I think there was also something, it wasn't just about the fact that we finished this film during the pandemic. It was also that we finished the film during this moment where I think we're really um, in this moment of, um, with the George Floyd murder, that we're all trying to sort of examine our own responsibility in the um, uh, landscape that we're in and really think about what it means to be uh, European and and I, I, I sort of feel like in that way as well bringing my own status as an outsider but as a specifically European who'd come to California um, and kind of examining that was um, a moment to do that as well. The film covers so much and one of the things that I found that was very different from the typical in that moment fire coverage is the focus on the firefighters themselves. And, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, when in the midst of looking at all these different angles and perspectives, you landed on, I need to spend 
time here as well and how you got them because you know I've talked with a lot of firefighters these are often men and women who don't like to show any sign of weakness so to get them to open up about what they were really facing just how devastating it was how that it could ruin marriages how you were able to get to that point with them well actually the um, inspiration for making the film had come from um, having friends who were involved both as firefighters and residents in the Thomas fire, which was um, a reference at the beginning of the narration where I started this film was um, the Thomas fire, which was four years ago, um, uh, exactly this time of year, was um, the, at the time, largest fire ever in California, and now it's only the seventh largest four years later, which I think tells you a lot about how rapidly um, these fires are getting worse. Um, and uh, I had friends in Ojai and Santa Barbara as residents and as firefighters, and it was so dramatic what they were going through, and I just kept thinking, why is there not a film about this? So I was always very acutely aware of the trauma and drama and intensity of what was being experienced from both the firefighters and the residents. I don't think there was a time when I wasn't aware of that. Um, and maybe it was my naivete, but, or my experience with other situations where I've always managed to kind of get access to that, um, that people have, um, in my experience filming with them, been really generous. When what you are interested in is the truth of the situation that they're experiencing, I've really, um, been blown away by people's generosity in sharing um, these incredibly painful, intimate, um, emotional truths of their lives um, because they seem to know that the story will really um, benefit others by being shared honestly. And if you can find that um, frequency with people, they'll um, stun you with their um, candor and um, eloquence. And um, I found that true here too. I didn't have any challenge with people opening up, in fact, I think, and it's a shame we don't have Maeve to speak to this here today, because the firefighters who've seen the film, I think, have said, like, why has no one told this story before? And when I think about the sort of adulation that we shower firefighters with, right, they're our heroes, and culturally, they're the pinups of the people that we admire, as they should be, because um, really, they're just, I was in awe of them before I made this, and um, my appreciation of them only ever grew when I spent time with them up close. I just couldn't believe what incredibly um, generous um, creatures they are. They only, if you want to torture a firefighter, ask them about something where they wanted to help more and they feel like they should have helped more. You know, they only want to help us more um, um, to such an extraordinary degree. And people talk about, you know, yay firefighters all the time. But when you see that town council meeting and you see the fire, Paradise Fire Chief explaining um, so clearly the reality of his job and that nobody does actually listen to their experience um, or help them do that job that they're dying to, to do for us, to save us. And so for me, the, the kind of cognitive dissonance of that, you know, just you, for me, I just sort of want to get in there and point that out, you know, that that's what's, that that's the truth of their experience is that, that and, and I think that's so easy in this world to kind of feel like we can keep consuming, we can keep building, we can keep growing, we can keep inflating, we can keep having this world that shines more and more, right? And that there isn't a cost and the cost you know, when you talk to the firefighters and you understand what their lives are like, you start to understand where um, this inflation is 
taking, you know, um, its fuel from or whatever, and um, in their quality of life or in their actual lives, and uh, in in terms of their lives um, taken in in their work and stuff. I really am jet lagged, so um, help me with some practical questions. But um, well, yeah, but I wish the firefighters were here because the firefighters will say this is the first film that's talked about what life is like for us, and they're really. Um, and I kind of look around and think, why has nobody told that story? Because there's been tons of like smoke jumpers, yay kind of stuff. And it is, it's pretty fucking, excuse my language, fun to watch the, they're, they're really like amazing action figures, right? But I think this stuff um, seems very intuitive, it seems very obvious to me. But we live in a culture where one, we don't have much of a threshold for pain or discomfort and we do quick, we do quick really, really, really well, I think. And one of the things I found remarkable about the city council scene was when they said, let's just remember what it was like that day, which I think asked me to, leads me to a very practical question for you about the beginning part of this film. Um, when I watched it, you know, the, the good folks who organized this evening said, oh, it would just, it's the first time I've ever actually, as a moderator, gotten kind of a trigger warning, like, be aware the first half hour is really a lot. And I was like, oh, it's fire. I've covered every one of these fires since 2003. And yet I really felt like sitting with fire in that way, which I think really goes to show the power of documentary. It's not a tweet. It's not a 5 p.m. newscast. It's not an LA Times story. Can you talk a little bit about your choices about that opening of the movie and especially sitting with so much of it, so much of the peril and so much of the pain for so long? Because it definitely had an impact. I think for everything you saw going forward. Mm. So much to say. Um, uh, I didn't want to kind of traumatize people for the sake of showing off my filmmaking skills. You know, it's all too easy to take material like that, which is so intense, and make it look intense. You know, because it is inherently um, uh, extraordinary um, what people have suffered, and now with. Um, the cameras that we have, you know, the amazing coverage that we have of these disasters with people's smartphones. Um, because most of that footage was not shot by us, although some of it was. Most of it was stuff that people would like airdrop to me when I met them. Or um, like the 911 calls we got through freedom of information requests, the radio traffic, you can, um, you can pull all this stuff as matters of public record, right? And we come through uh, myself and the editor has come through a lot of it, and it was really um, sad work, you know, to do that. Um, but I always felt that it was important to understand and communicate what it was really like in those incidents. And um, so as I picked through this morass of material, trying to think about what to include, um, I wanted to include the pieces that would really empower the audience to then understand um, the kind of investigation moving forward about what I felt were the interesting and important pieces, and usually the non-obvious pieces, but the um, I wanted um, the audience to experience the, the confusion, the kind of fog of war of it all, the um, lack of information, the speed, um, the fact that so many lives were saved by individual acts of creativity and desperation, and the wind blowing one way or the other could make all the difference, and and so on and so on. But I, th you know, and that lives were lost and lost in those specific ways that they were and the firefighters are tired and their shifts are 24 hours and just some of the, the facts on the ground of those things and that people do stay and defend and um, the people that you meet did live to tell those tales and um, so forth. So I kind of wanted you to, to sort of understand what I'd learned about this situation. Um, and um, it was extraordinary making the film because I kind of felt like I spoke to so many people and I'd gathered so many stories that I felt like um, it was uh, weird. I felt like I knew what happened on every block of the incident, particularly in Paradise, 
Um, I'd spoken to so many people I knew. I'd heard the anecdotes from eight different people who'd never met each other, you know, but I knew about the stopped truck full of soda that different people at different points during the morning had stopped and gotten the soda off the back of that truck because the, the cans were just sitting there and they were thirsty or whatever it was, you know. And I knew the dozer driver has never met the guy that he rescued. I interviewed them separately and, and pieced together who that was and tracked them all down, right? So it kind of to feel like you had done so much um, insane amount of research that um, you had this um, strange kind of godlike perspective on the whole sort of chessboard of this incident um, because it wasn't obvious what were the important elements. I think the reporting on the fires is getting better and better. Um, but even um, at the beginning of making this film, it wasn't as well understood as we're starting to get to it now. I think we're starting to understand this this more and more. It's being better reported. The logging story has still not been reported, um, but other pieces of it, you know. But but there were loads of theories that were bogus. I mean, some are obviously bogus, like laser pointers and the conspiracy theories are easy to dismiss. But there are other theories as well that seem to hold water and you really examine them. And so my job was to really, I mean, I was really trying to understand what were the important pieces of the story to to see and then to share. Um, so it was a lot of work. What can I say about that? And but the but the pieces that I kept were the pieces that I felt would would equip the audience the best to take the journey of the rest of the film. The point was never to just have that immersion and terror at the beginning. The the point was to set you up so that when you see that town council meeting, you understand why it's amazing that less than a year after that incident, that community would not do free things, you know, cost free things to not have that happen again. That's that's the journey that you're taking on. So you have to start there to set that up, to pay that off. Well, and I think there's a coda too, which is where I'd like to end our chat tonight as well, because I think at the beginning, there is there is such pure terror and horror from the destruction that fire causes, and that's how we tend to think of it, fire bad, right? But at the end, and I love, I believe it was the, you know, the Japanese poem about how the fire destroys the house, but now I have this view. And I'm curious in the making of that, and especially that, that kind of those final chapters, if your attitude about fire, where you sit with it right now, when you think, why is this something that happens? Not from a factual, okay, here's clear cutting, here's climate change, but like the big why, the spiritual why, the existential why. Oh, don't get me started on the spiritual why. My gosh, I, um, I go, I go um, far out on the spiritual why. I don't know if we should go there. We could end with a little spiritual far out. Well, I kind of, it's in the end somewhat, right? And I just, isn't it incredible? The indigenous cultural practitioners in this. You know, I was on a panel recently with Deadline magazine with Trina and Don, who are in the film, and they just spoke so beautifully about their work. And their work's so amazing. And I thought, my God, I must be doing something right if I'm. They're getting to talk about their work with this um, Hollywood audience. I felt so moved. Um, to help give them, you know, the platform, um, because I think what they're doing is so brilliant. But, um, you know, for me, you know, fire is the landscape breathing, you know, and um, it's what we've forgotten as a culture, you know, which is rest, which is um, renewal, and. Um, and so I, I don't know, I, sh I, sh I could go very deep on that, but I, I, I've thought a lot about it and it's been an incredible opportunity making this film to think from all the different angles about this fire issue. I mean, there's so many things, and I'm sure as audience, you know, there's so many different 
sort of things to think about or that I got obsessed with at different points making the film, you know, like what would you take? What what of your belongings means anything? Um, or, you know, when fire burns everything away, you know, it is extraordinary that it kind of fire burns off and you reveals, you know, the bones of your life, you know, when fire takes your house, you really see what um, people are made of, you know, and what their lives are made of. And so with all these different kind of things I was um, reflecting upon when I was making the film. And um, perhaps you see that I was really interested in all this stuff along the way when you watch the film. Lucy, thank you so much for bringing your own brigade and for your time tonight. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> At the end, the last thing I was going to say is, um, uh, if, if people, I wasn't sure if the audience was going to get to ask questions, but since they weren't, you can always. Um, uh, reach us at Lucy Walker Film. I'm at Lucy Walker Film. If you ever have any questions or want to um, spread word about the film or ask anything more, please be in touch. And thank you so much for being here. It's really um, amazing to be in real life. So thank you. Mm -hmm.